I'm going to be, um, this paper that I'm using, I'm going to email to you. I emailed the group last week's Matthew 24 up to verse 30. So you should have that on your email. Do you have a timeline or a file? Yeah, I'll send that to you too. If you would, if, did you get a your email? Yeah, I got it. Okay, because you need to read the timeline she presented here a while back. So if you didn't check your email in the last four or five hours, because she's probably in your inbox today, and you'll understand what she's talking about. I'll be right with if you don't have your email address, get it to us tonight if you want to be on the list. This is one of the, the things we did on the calculating the, the years. I think that's all there. Thank you. Still have all those fell backwards again. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start at Matthew 24, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Remember, we're getting into this because certain doctrines that have traditionally been taught in church, at least churches I've gone to, have set this as meaning for the church. The wise and foolish virgins become those left behind at the rapture. I mean, all this craziness. And I believed it until I said, Holy Spirit's telling me something's not right. I don't know what it is. I guess I'm going to have to look. So I, I actually spent, I don't know how many hours, days, and years <laughs> trying to figure this out. Verse 31, about sending the angels with the sound of the trumpet, which church equates with the big trumpet sound when we go up, to gather his elect, because the church is his elect, from the four winds, meaning, remember, the four winds is not heaven and earth. It's the atmosphere around the earth. It's the earth. It's where we live. So the angels are going to gather people from around the whole world when Christ comes back. What's Christ talking about in Matthew 24? He's talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to his apostles, but this is to the Jewish people. The church wasn't here yet. This is not the rapture. Jesus is speaking of immediately after the tribulation of those days. He's speaking of the things to come after the great tribulation. That is his second coming. He already stated in the previous verses to not believe it if someone tells you he's here or there. Because where is he? He's still in heaven. He's not here or there. The elect in this verse is also not the church. He mentioned the elect three times in Matthew 24. For the elect's sake, one, the days will be shortened. Two, if it were possible, the elect would be deceived. But it's not possible. Three, his angels would gather the elect from the four winds or corners of the earth. So who are the elect? This is another place where people get the church mixed up and then believe the elect is the church, so they surmise the rapture is post-trib because here we all are. But Matthew 24 is not about the church. It's about Israel. If you look back at the signs that are shown from verses 1 to 8. There are things that we're beginning to see now, still within the church age. But these signs will have an ultimate fulfillment during the tribulation period. For example, famine and pestilence exist today. But the ultimate famine and pestilence will be during the tribulation period. And there's a cross-reference in that to Revelation 6, 6 through 9. False Christs exist today, but the ultimate false Christ will be the Antichrist during the tribulation. And there's a cross-reference again in Re Revelation 6, 1 to 19. Earthquakes exist today, they're becoming more and more frequent, but the ultimate earthquake will take place during the tribulation period. And there's a cross-reference to Revelation in verse of uh, chapter 16. And wars and rumors of wars exist today, but the ultimate war will be the Battle of Armageddon during the Tribulation period. Again, the cross-reference is found in Revelation 19. 
But starting at verse 9, Matthew 24, 9, Matthew 24 is about Israel, Israel alone. The gospel of the kingdom mentioned in verse 14 will be preached in all the world by 144,000 Jews. Revelation 7. Cross-reference. Two witnesses, at least one of which will probably be a Jew. Uh, we won't get into who they are. But there'll be a Jew, a Jew there. And there's a rep. Uh, Revelation reference in 11, chapter 11, and an angel, Revelation 14, the holy place mentioned in verse 15 will be in the temple in Jerusalem in Israel. Those who are in Judea mentioned in verse 16 refer to the people in the West Bank in Israel, the Palestinians. The Sabbath mentioned in verse 20 is the Jewish holy day. The elect mentioned in verse 22 is Israel. I'm not going to keep giving all the cross-references because you'll see that when I send it to you. Verse 28 is a parable about the battle of Armageddon in Israel. Remember where the carcasses are? Yeah. The, the eagles will be there. Basically, it teaches that wherever the dead body or carcass is, the Palestinian eagle gathers to devour the flesh. And verses 29 through 31 are about the gathering of the Jews to Israel at the second coming. And as we will see in verses 32 and 33, they're about the fig tree Israel. Verses 37 to 41 are about the removal of the lost at the second coming, not the removal of the church at the rapture. How do we know that? The lost were removed from the earth in the days of Noah. Noah was saved. He stayed on the earth. Jesus said in Matthew, it will be as the days of Noah. So if the angels are gathering his elect together, they're staying on the earth. Not going in a rapture. In conclusion, Matthew 24 is profitable for the church, but they are about Israel, not the church. And therefore, the elect whom the angels are gathering are the tribes of the earth. The Jewish tribes, we're not called tribes. We're called peoples or whatever, like all the other <coughs> names for it, but not tribes. The Jewish tribes who are dwelling in all the parts of the earth. And God knows who and where they are. So in verse 32 to 34, and we're only going to go up to just a couple more. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. You know the summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, what things? What he just described in the previous verses. The global conditions, the beginning of sorrows. The great tribulation, the abomination, the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. He already just went through all those. Know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now this passage may not be anything more than a simple analogy to nature. Because the Luke passage, the parallel Luke passage, adds all the trees, not just the fig tree. So this very well looks like it's just another parable. Eliminating the possibility of a hidden meaning with the fig tree. But the popular interpretation and the prophetic interpretation considers the fig tree as a type or illustration of Israel. Israel became a nation in 1948 and it does symbolically constitute the budding of the fig tree just as the comparison to the Valley of Dry Bones constitutes the illustration of coming back to life, yet not having the breath or spirit of God within them yet. Since the inference is that the fig tree does represent Israel, we might then read the passage as a prophecy, saying, when you see Israel putting forth leaves or being reborn, then you know that then that all these things are near. Assuredly, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. This is what leads us to say 
that were the final generation. For it was this generation that saw the rebirth of Israel. And, there, and some people say, well, it's the generation since 1967 when, Israel, when Jerusalem was reunified. But if, if, if it's 1948, it's still this, this generation. We're all still here. I was born in 1906. And, and how many years is considered a generation? 70 years. 70 years. Well, 100 years, isn't it? it, it, it there's there's, well, that's a there's varied lengths of generation for individuals, <laughs> but there's only... I think it's 70, yeah. Yeah, well, it's between 70 by strength 8. Yeah, oh, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. But if you're talking about the nation of Israel, the first time God called Israel a nation... They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So Israel's national generation is 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was all excited when 2007 came because I thought, oh, it's going to happen. What a great time to be sat outside waiting for that. <laughs> what can I say? I was a false prophet. We still believe. Oh, well. Oh, yeah. It's better for you to watch it than to sleep. I should say, one of these days, she's going to have it right. Oh, yeah. Okay, verse 35 and 36. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 35 assures us that God's words will abide firm and will never pass away. Verse 36 is not referring to the rapture. In context, it's referring to the previous verse, when heaven and earth shall pass away. When will heaven and earth pass away? Well, no one can know the day or hour. But we can certainly know from God's word that it will not occur until sometime after Christ's thousand-year kingdom reign. We know that historically Matthew 24, 34 really did happen, that within a generation of Jesus' death and resurrection, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans. So if Matthew 24, 35 is simply an historical fact and not a future prophetic warning, then we would now be living in the new heaven and earth. But we're not. And if that would be true, we got cheated because, frankly, this world is evil. Verse 37 and 39, and I'm, I'm speeding up. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's true that as the days of as the days of Noah were, so is the world now in the same spiritual condition, evil continually. But what Jesus is demonstrating in verses 37 to 39 is how it will be when the second coming takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. Verses 40 and 42 demonstrate how it will be. And this is what we're going to end with. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now let's analyze this. This disappearance is not the rapture of the church. Here are two reasons why we know this is not the rapture. One, Matthew 24 is a chronological account of a seven-year tribulation period, and this event takes place at the end of the chapter. Matthew 24, 40, and 41 are specifics regarding how the second return of Christ will take place. In the Noah scenario, who left the earth and who stayed behind? The answer, the wicked were taken away, swept away by the flood, leaving the righteous family of Noah remaining on earth to repopulate. So at the end of the Great Tribulation and at the Second Coming, the wicked disappear and are destroyed in Revelation 19, and the righteous remain on earth to populate the millennium. The rapture is not the second coming of Christ. According to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53, Jesus appears in the clouds of the rapture, and believers meet him in the air. 
There is no return of Jesus to the earth at that time. Jesus does return to the earth at the end of the tribulation when the wicked are destroyed off the earth and the righteous remain for the millennium. Therefore, the two in the field and the two grinding where one is taken and one is left is that the wicked one is taken away to judgment here and that the righteous one is left for the millennium just as Noah and his family were left to repopulate the earth. So you can see Matthew 24, verses 40 to 42, where Jesus is telling them how it's going to be when he comes back in the second coming, where he's going to start his kingdom and take the mortals who survive into his kingdom and judge them, the sheep and the goats judgment, one is the wicked are gone, the righteous are left. So this whole Matthew 24 or 40 is about the second coming, not the rapture of the church. The resurrection and rapture of the church. Next time we're, we're going to begin with, and we're getting into more exciting things about how the, to compare like the wise and foolish virgins. They're not Christians left behind. We're talking about Jews. So the next time we'll, we'll begin with verse 43 in the parable of the thief in the night. And we're slowly building a firm foundation for understanding our place in the timeline. When we get the right people in the right place, Everything else will lock into place, and Israel is the key. So, verse uh, verse forty three will start with the good man, of, good man of the house, you know that whole thing. So, and I'll send that to you in the email. And I still challenge you to find me verses where the Jews are not resurrected until the end. Do we have any?